okay so this is uh, this is what this is lecture 27 27 okay so the last thing we were saying was this uh, uh, was this update rule at the check node how do you quickly compute it how do you write it down we try to simplify it and finally we had some expression we had to deal with this function and i want to talk a little bit about that about that function right what was this function log tan hyperbolic I'm sorry yeah mod x by 2 okay so so i think it's good to i think people when trying to invert it had some trouble with signs and all that i want to talk about it uh, first of all another thing i want to talk point out is we we are only worried about the magnitude here right right the sign of f of x is not uh, that relevant so i might i might even think of this as that being a modulus outside okay but usually you don't put that i'll tell you I'll tell you why it's, it's not really necessary okay so how will tan hyperbolic x look if you plot it versus x yeah i don't know maybe x by 2 okay how will that look yeah what is the value at 0 0 and then at 1 it is at infinity it will get to 1 okay and then it will rise and what will be its slope at zero i think it will be something non zero so it will get some it will start off somewhere and then go this way if it is just do x by 2 you would get uh, up to minus 1 if i do mod x by 2 it will only go in that way but anyway i'll i'll plot x by 2 so i'll get something that looks like this okay so what's important is it lies between plus 1 and minus 1 okay so to be able to take logarithms and all i have to do modulus but what will happen if i take logarithm of tan hyperbolic of x by 2 will i get a positive value or negative value it will all be negative right because tan hyperbolic is x less than 1 okay so if you take logarithms you're always only going to get negative value so log of tan hyperbolic of x by 2 after you take logarithms will always be negative okay so you can as well add i mean you can take absolute value and add add that's what we want so we will it's the same as just adding and then ignoring the sign at the end just taking the positive magnitude value okay so if you were to plot this function f of x if you want to be careful about it it would look something like this if you just plot x versus fx okay for the positive part it looks something like this okay it will be a function like this and it will be symmetric around the x equals y line okay so that's what i claimed by saying it's its own inverse right if you swap the x and y axis the function doesn't change it looks exactly the same okay so it will be symmetric that way and that you can show okay yeah yes yes the value is negative always yeah you, i mean you might have to do minus f of x minus f1 or something but but it doesn't matter if you only worry 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 only about the magnitude you might as well flip it up and put it there okay so we'll have some minus sign issues but uh, but i for simplicity i'll simply write f as being its own inverse and i'll write f of x is log tan hyperbolic mod x by 2 okay so the sign problem is understood and you have to take care of it when you uh when you do your uh, okay hope that's clear okay so there'll be one uh, issue so so when we deal with this function f of x i'll simply write f of x as log tan hyperbolic mod x by 2 and i'll say f of f of x is x okay so there is a sign up to sign these things are true we'll just take sign only only magnitudes okay since all of it is negative this will work out properly okay so there's one comment i wanted to make about the derivations we did last class so let's proceed now so let me rewrite what is it that we had okay so if you have okay so this is the recap of what we did last class if you had x being y1 plus y2 plus so on till y or let me say d okay then and if pi is zero is probability that y is zero and uh, let's say there's one more uh, thing no so and yi is the log likelihood ratio right so log of uh, pi is zero by pi1 okay then yx we are able to write as 
right in two ways basically the the magnitude of yx will be what f of summation i equals 1 to d f of y okay and then what about sine what product of the signs okay so is that clear okay so reasonably clear right so so there's one more uh, so this is one minor point here i don't want to beat about it too much but one thing that you can observe it's very interesting so sin you typically think of as what sin is sin of x so i want to write down what sin of x is okay i want to put i here sin of x is you usually think of it as plus 1 if x is greater than 0 and minus 1 if x is less than 0 okay yeah so put greater than or equal to somewhere okay so so that's how you think of uh, sin of x and this product rule holds okay so suppose i suppose i do something else suppose i say sin bar of x is is 0 if x is greater than 0 and 1 if x is less than 0 okay <coughs> suppose i define another function which is 0 when it's positive and 1 when it's negative the same product rule can be written in a different way okay so you can write sin bar of yx is as what So in fact, you can notice sine bar is what? Minus 1 to the power sine x. Am I right? No, no, no. Sine x is minus 1 to the power sine bar of x. Do you notice? Okay. So if you do this replacement here, you will see minus 1 to the power sine bar of y x equals product of minus 1 to the power sine bar of y. So when you multiply it out, you will see you will get addition. Okay. And then addition I can do modulo 2 the reason is minus 1 squared is 1 so I will get the whole equation to be consistent okay so this is uh, sine bar of y1 plus sine bar of y2 plus 1 sine bar of y2 okay so basically the reason why you do this is in your uh, implementation or your program you can deal with the sign separately and the magnitude separately okay so that's an that's an advantage in some cases the sign will go in one way and then your magnitude will go in one way then you multiply the sign and magnitude to get the final uh, final actual value okay so that those are things to uh, keep in mind when you want to implement so you can deal with it in uh, different ways okay so bit is always better storing minus 1 and plus 1 might be a little clumsy in implementations but 0 and 1 is always easy to understand okay so those are a few comments so let me go back to the the message passing decoder now so i'm going to go to the soft message passing decoder when we last left it we were looking at what what were we looking at <coughs> we were looking at step b of iteration one right so it's what we were looking at so let me write down what that is okay so i was looking at a check node okay well check node of degree e right okay and i said the messages that it would have received in step a we will suppose are yi1, yi2, yie. So those are my log likelihood ratios of the corresponding bits that are connected on the other side of those edges. Okay, so that's what it would have got, right? So that was received. And uh, now some processing needs to be done. So what is the processing? Suppose you concentrate on the first edge. Okay, we wanted to figure out. the message that needs to go there okay so i will call it 
v1 okay v no no I think uh, did i did i have you remember the notation what what is the notation we used for in gallagher a v is the message from check node to bit node did i indicate the iteration number there yes. i did that okay so v1 okay so i'll say v1 i'll i'll put one here for the edge number okay so this is the first edge on the first edge in the first iteration connected to this degree e check node okay so this is my message v1 one okay right so i'm going to deal with what am I, what do i have to send okay so i already done this computation this this will have to be the log likelihood ratio of the bit i1 calculated using the other log likelihood ratios like before like using what relationship using the relationship that bit i1 is the xor of all the remaining other bits okay so how will i do that i'll do it in two ways i'll compute the magnitude of v1 and the sine of v1 how will i compute the magnitude of v1 i'll use this f function right f of f of what okay yeah y y1 by 2 am i right f of y1 right okay i've defined the function to be that itself plus f of y2 no i think yi2 no i'm sorry i'm sorry even that b is b okay yi2 why i3 am i making a mistake why is everybody staring at me i don't have to write modulus right yeah it's already there absorbed inside the function you're right let me write it down once again why i2 okay i'll just quickly erase the whole thing okay since the modulus is already absorbed into the function i might as well write it as f of why i <laughs> yeah i mean i could have written a sigma i just didn't want to write it i wanted to write the whole thing out so, but remember this is my magnitude my f is only going to give me positive values right it won't give me negative values so this is the magnitude how do i how do i do the sign okay i i can do it in both ways i can either do sign of v1 or sign bar of v1 both of them would be the same i would do sign I mean, you, can, you can convert to sign bar if you want the sign of v1 one would be what product of sign of Okay, so I, I won't do product. I'll just write it out. I'll write it out fully. I'm sorry for this. Just to show how it works, right? Sine of y i two, sine of y i three, so on till sine of y i. So this is what I would do for the first edge. How will I do v v two one? Okay, so how do I do v two one? on the second edge what would i send yeah i just skip the yi2 in all the summation but include yi1 okay so the magnitude if you were to do it will have to be f of f of yi1 plus f of <coughs> yi3 right and you go on to f of yi okay so likewise you can write an expression for sin the product will involve yi1 to yie it will not have yi2 okay so likewise if i keep on writing what will be magnitude of ve1 okay so i'll have to do the summation from yi1 to yi e minus Okay, so those are my update rules in step B of the first iteration for a degree E check node. Okay, all the E messages that it will have to send out back to the bits that are connected to it, you'll have to do this. Okay, if you were to actually implement this, right? If you do it brute force, if you compute each magnitude separately, it will involve a lot of additions. How do you simplify your uh, computation here? Add all of them and subtract one at a time to get each of your magnitudes. Okay, all of them are uh, positive. It will work out that. Way. Same way for the sign. What will, what will you do for the sign? <coughs> multiply all the signs and then, <coughs> then you multiply out one after the other to get the individual things. Okay, so those are simplifications you can do in your actual implementation. Okay, so that's that's the expression. It doesn't look too scary now. Okay, so for any e, one can do this without uh, too much confusion.
okay so let's go to iteration 2 sorry with suffix i <laughs> so well i'm taking an arbitrary check node and i want to say it is connected to bits i1 i2 i3 so on till ie i want to say that if i say they are connected if i put y1 through ye if you go back and look at the way i wrote down the channel llrs i said yi is the llr of bit i okay but if i put y1 there it's not bit 1 it may not be bit 1 it's some bit i1 so that's why I put. initially i put y1 through ye people objected to it so i changed it to y1 to ye okay so that that shows you something about uh, well about consensus and what somebody has to do. okay so let's move to iteration l now step a <coughs> so what's going to happen to a degree d okay bit node i need to put a circle degree d bit node which received yi from the channel remember the channel is always there okay it got yi as the channel likelihood ratio okay so in step b of iteration l minus 1 I need to see what would have happened. Right? The same bit node uh, would have received what? It would have received D different messages. And in my notation, it, I'm going to see um, there will be a notational ambiguity here. I'm going to simply call it with v l minus 1 i'm going to say 1 to d okay so hopefully you won't confuse with the previous thing i'm just simply calling them just for ease of uh, notation it's possible to be consistent it's possible to number all the edges if you want and then put that suffix as the edge suffix okay i'm just simply so you see what i mean right you number all the edges and every edge you can put a suffix there i'm just not doing that i'm simply calling it v1 through vd for convenience okay so it's possible to do that okay those are its messages okay so now i have to figure out how will this guy process i'm sorry v2 okay again once again i'll look at the first edge and then we'll figure out the other things as we go along okay so i'll call this u1 l okay the message from bit node to check node calling it so what are all these v's v l minus ones what are they are they bits or they're all llrs right what are they llrs of estimates of what bit bit i the ith bit what is y i y i is also another llr which is again an estimate of bit okay so i'm going to assume now i'm going to make my iid assumption now i'm going to say all these estimates are independent they've come from different parts of the code word they don't reuse any received value in deriving all these estimates so this goes with the neighborhood tree like assumption if your neighborhood is tree like up to depth 2l depth l or depth 2l whatever whatever depth that is okay so depth 2l i think then all these llrs would have come from different received values of your code word there would have, there would have been no repetition in my neighborhood so all of them will be independent so when i get probabilities from independent events what can i do to get a consolidated probability I can multiply all of them okay so i can multiply the probabilities and if i do in terms of llr what will happen after after multiplying if i take log it will become summation okay right so the message u1l should be an updated llr which uses yi v2 l minus 1 through vd l minus 1 so a very simple nice thing using the iid assumption to do is to say v1 uh, u1l will be yi plus v2 l minus 1 plus so on till vd l minus 1 okay i'm simply going to add all the remaining the reason is i can multiply those probabilities because they all come from independent constraints and independent received different received values they don't overlap <coughs> okay Okay, so maybe maybe I'll try to give you a different interpretation based on the neighborhood 
and talk about this independence and and one needs to be a little bit careful uh, when when i talk about it but hopefully the slightly hand waving argument is clear enough is there a question so i don't have a, okay so the question is see what i'm doing here is very different from what i'm doing at the check note do you agree this is not what i did at the check note okay so here all of these llrs are for the same bit the check note does not receive all llrs for the same bit it receives llrs from different bits and it has to update one of the llrs according to the condition here all the llrs are for the same bit okay so using the other so so the way to think about it is okay so i'll do it just uh, so that you can get a picture in your head okay so think of the tree okay the neighborhood tree this u v2 l minus 1 is coming from one part of the tree which means it will include all the constraints of the check nodes in that part of the tree and all the received values from the bit nodes in that part of the tree v3 l minus 1 will come from another part of the tree okay it will include all the constraints of the check nodes in that part of the tree and it will include all the received values in that part of the tree as long as these parts don't overlap i can simply multiply those probabilities and and say that the overall value i get after multiplication includes the entire tree all the constraints have been included and all the received values have been included. if you do all that so what am i trying to compute remember i'm trying to compute app llrs probability that beta is zero given the entire received vector and all the constraints are satisfied all the constraints of my parity check are satisfied so the way this is going is i'm doing depth by depth on my neighborhood tree okay so and i'm consolidating at each part i'm including more and more received values i'm including more and more constraints okay so that's the way to think about it a little bit uh, further so i think that's clear enough i think uh, but but you can be convinced at several levels but you should be convinced at this level also okay <laughs> yes how do you multiply hmm why do i multiply <laughs> so <coughs> sorry yeah so so what you have to compute is see so the way to think about it is this is this is something uh, <laughs> some so probability this is a ratio of what ratio of some probability that ci is zero given ri see right prob this event right this is some probability of ci is zero given ri alone what will this be ci is zero given what that's the question you have to ask given all the other checks and bit node values in the in that part of the tree from which it came from okay so that's what it will be likewise you have to ask for each of these questions this will also be probability that ca is zero given something else that the other part of the tree what do i want this to be is the next question i want this to be ca equal to zero given ri and all these other guys okay so maybe i call this as some m1 okay so maybe i call this as this entire thing what all it includes maybe i'm going to call it as some capital m1 all this that include all that is included here maybe i'll call it md okay so maybe i should be consistent i'll say m2 okay what do i want u1 to be it i want it to be the probability that ci is zero given ri m2 so on till md all those conditions have to be satisfied okay that's what i you know well, all those conditions have to be included in the computation that's what i want to do and since all these guys are independent when i write it down as probabilities and events i can i can multiply those probabilities okay so you, usually you must have been used to independence of probability of ab is probability of a times probability of b okay this is also something very similar okay something very similar i have i am i'm conditioning on independent stuff and evaluating probabilities independently when i want to consolidate everything i can multiply okay so when i do that it works out this way <coughs> okay so think about it it's uh it's a little bit uh, maybe i'll i'll write down a actual tree example at that point maybe it will be a little bit more clear maybe later on maybe sometime next week we'll see a proper example where these things work out uh, in a very nice way so we can see a equal to zero given r which we actually want to cover all the all the bits in this sequence uh so one iterating till all the bits are covered okay so the question is so, so he is asking what i really want is what what do i want finally 
I want CI equals 0 given the entire received vector R. Okay, so this is what I want finally. So he's saying, can I stop when my neighborhood includes all the bits? Okay, but the point is one needs to be a little bit careful. Okay. See, remember, you're, you're assuming that your neighborhood does not have repetition, and all your computations are based on that repetition. So this this probabilities will be accurate only when there's no repetition. If there is a repetition, these calculations that you did are not accurate. See, what did you do at the check node? You made you made the independence assumption to be able to multiply all of those things up. If those assumptions are not true, then your computation is wrong. The probability that you are sending is not the actual probability. Okay, So that is why this is not the MAP decoder, but it is some message passing decoder, which is an approximation of the MAP decoder. So I am not, so when I write this down, you should be careful. See, I am not saying these are the accurate probabilities. These are accurate if my neighborhood uh, tree-like assumption holds. The moment that fails, this is not accurate. Okay, But what I want to be able to do in real life is, even when it fails, I want to be able to run the message passing decoder. Okay, so you remember Gallagher A, right? I showed you simulations. Even when those independence assumptions fails, what happens to the message passing decoder? It succeeds. So I want to be able to do a similar thing in the soft decision decoding also. Even if those assumptions are not true, I want to keep iterating, hoping that the hoping that it'll it'll do something good for me. Okay, and that actually happens in soft decoders. So that's why you make the IID assumption and come up with rules which are valid under the IID assumption. And then even if it is violated, hopefully it won't go too far of course. Okay, any other question on this? <coughs> okay, so we can only approximate this. Okay, again approximate also I'll put in brackets because nobody has really shown that these things are true, but CE or SE? I don't know, check that. Okay, I think it's C. Okay. All right. So after all that explanation, hopefully the rule is a little bit clear. So you notice I'm including YA always. Okay. So I have to include YA always, right? Because when I mean, the way my assumption went, YA would not have been included in all of these other things. Okay. That's how my that's how I did my calculations. Okay. So let's let's do V U2 now. How will I do U2? U2L will be what? Okay, so it's very easy now. Yi plus V1 L minus 1 plus V3 L minus 1 plus so on till Vd L minus 1. Okay, so on till Udl, which would be Yi plus V1 L minus 1 plus V2 L minus 1 plus Vd minus 1. L minus 1. So maybe I'll reproduce this U1L here just for completeness. Yi plus V2L minus 1 plus V3L minus 1 plus VDL minus 1. <coughs> so the update at the bit nodes is decidedly simpler than the the update at the check node, right? You don't do any non-linear lookup or anything. It's just simple addition. And how will you actually implement this addition? If you were to do it, you don't have to do it. Yeah, add all of them and subtract one at a time. That will always be more efficient than doing uh, the entire uh, addition individually. Okay. So that's the update rule at the bit node. So I can write down step B now for iteration L. Okay. So it, it's not very different from what I wrote before. Instead of Yi1 through Yie, what will I have? I'll have U1L through Uel. That's all. So then you just replace Yi by this. Okay. So replace Yi1, Yi2, Yie with some U1L, U2L. U E L and repeat same steps. <coughs> okay. <coughs> 
so now you can keep on doing iterations go on and on and on forever right as many iterations as you want you can do you will keep getting better and better values okay so there's also a question of decisions what about output llrs after a particular iteration i want to be able to make a decision after every iteration so how do you do that so i'll write down here decision after iteration l okay after the in iteration l after step b okay what will a particular bit node get yes it will get v1 l so on till vd l right suppose you say this is the degree d bit node it would get okay so when i want to make decisions right when i wanted to pass a message back to some bit node i had to ignore one information but when i want to make decisions overall i don't have to ignore anything i'll just simply take everything together okay so i'll say output llr equals yi plus v1l plus v2l plus so on till vd <coughs> so what will be ci cap after l iterations uh, yeah if zero if this is positive and one it is if this is negative okay and can how do you decide if you can stop after iteration l <coughs> you take your ci cap and calculate h times ci cap. if the h times ci cap works out to zero what can you say maybe you can stop saying that i have achieved the goal okay <coughs> so ci cap after iteration l zero if output llr greater than 0 one else and c cap after iteration l will be c1 cap l C2 cap L, Cn cap L. Okay, so you can have a stopping condition. There's also other things that are possible. So typically in a VLSA implementation, there's usually no point in stopping ahead of time. Usually you have a clock and you always wait for the whole thing to end. So, so you can say after 10 iterations, I'll stop. I don't care about checking this in the middle. But you can also have an optional stop condition. In software, this might be useful. If you're writing a C program for simulation, this might be useful. K H C cap L transpose equal to zero can be a stopping condition. Then you know that your output is actually a code word, and you can stop. <coughs> okay. So those are ways of implementing this. Okay. So it's also good to visualize the stop soft disk and decoder in so many ways. On on the Tanner graph, if you were to visualize what's happening, you're getting soft values on the bit nodes from the channel. In the first iteration soft values are going on the edges and then again step b soft values are coming back on the edges step a of iteration 2 soft values are going back again okay in the first iteration step a from a bit node all the stop values uh, all the soft values that are going out are all the same but from iteration 2 onwards that will no longer be true okay the values can be different on each edge okay so that's the way to visualize it on the tanner graph in an actual implementation on c or something usually sparse matrices are easy to represent okay so you can think of those edges as being positions on my sparse matrix just like i showed you the animation with gallagher a right so each of these ones of my parity check matrix can actually represent the message that is flowing on that particular edge okay so and the zeros on my h will not be anything they'll be black and then they can be positive or negative you can visualize it on the matrix also it goes back and forth back and forth you update the matrix so in fact a lot of people think of bit node processing the update at the bit node as column process update at the check node as row processing because in implementation you always think of a matrix right so the graph well it's a useful tool to visualize it on an implementation maybe the matrix is what is easier to think of okay so people will say row update column update row update column update things like that 
<coughs> okay, there's so many other modifications for this uh, when it actually comes to implementation. Okay, so so I actually, I mean, I could have done an animation for this also, but I don't know if there's much point in it. Just give me one minute. So, no, so we'll uh, we'll look at uh, something else. Yes, sir, question. Okay, so the question is, what happens to the messages that are passed as the iterations go along? Can we say they converge, etc., etc.? So, things like that are very, very difficult to answer. Okay, so it's an immensely complicated system. This depends on too many parameters. So the only thing we'll do is we'll try to do an analysis like we did before. You remember what did we do for Gallagher? A? We were only we first assumed all zero code word, and then we were worried about the probability that a particular message is one at iteration L. Okay, so we'll do a similar thing for this also. Okay. But now the messages are actually soft values, right? They're real numbers. So what is the exact thing that we have to look at is something that we have to worry about. But but if you want to look at the whole system in terms of convergence of the set of messages, I don't know if you'll get very meaningful results. It's tough. I mean, it's, it's, uh, if you actually do the simulations and look at what happens, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So it's tough to analyze these kind of complex systems. <coughs> Any other question? So in an in an actual implementation in C or something you can do floating point representation for the messages. In actual implementation VLSA people usually do fixed point, and uh, it's okay. I mean it'll all work out. It'll all work out quite well. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's start off with the analysis. Okay. So density evolution for soft message passing decoding is the tricky thing, and we'll do that. Okay. How do you want to do it? Yeah, so you can do it with intensity of color. See, another thing to keep in mind about these LLRs is, suppose I say LLR for a particular bit is 1, okay, that is one thing I can say, plus 1, okay, what does it mean? I mean, how, how confident am I that that bit is 0 and not 1, okay, I'll have a certain degree of confidence, but if I say LLR is 100, Okay, suppose I say LLR for a particular bit is 100. What does it mean? It's almost Yeah, it's, it's 0. Okay, so when LLR is plus 100, the way I define it, it's, it's 0. I mean, I know that for sure. I don't have to worry about it. So the magnitude of the LLR tells me something about how sure am I, am I about that particular bit. Okay, same thing is true. If the LLR is minus 100, what does it mean? It is 1. I mean, you can do the calculation. You do e power 100 and all. That's it. You don't have to worry about the other probability. It won't work out. Okay. So, so the magnitude of the LLR tells me something about how strongly I believe that this is 0 or 1. Okay, The sign is what? Sign is <coughs> whether it is 0 or 1. So it's not a problem. So, so for instance, this question was how do you represent it in an animation? So in an animation, when I want to show something, I should use different colors, right? I should, uh, previously I had, I think, green for 0 and red for uh, 1. Okay, I should have a whole bunch of colors between green and red in different proportions mixing. As the LLR increases, the LLR increases, I should go towards green. The magnitude of the LLR increases and it's positive. The magnitude increases and it's negative, I should go towards red. Okay, and you'll get a whole bunch of other colors in the middle. So that's the advantage of this soft, uh, uh, I mean, that's the whole point of soft decoding. So the fact that you're not, you're not just worried about the bit being 0 or 1, you're worried about how confident you are that the bit is 0 or 1. Okay. All right. So now density evolution becomes more uh, difficult. So now I have to, previously I only had to track uh, the messages that were flowing, well the messages that were flowing on the edges for Gallagher A were very simple random variables. They just took two values, 0 or 1. Okay. So I could simply track the probability whether, <coughs> actually I was tracking the PDF of that random variable, PMF of that random variable. Right. But that PMF of a binary random variable is just one value. Right. If I know the one value, I know what the other value is. I was actually tracking that. Now, also, I will try to track the random variable which represents the message that's flowing on an edge. That's what I'll try to track once again. Okay, but now that random variable is actually a continuous random variable, so I'll have to track its PDF. Okay, so that's what density evolution in this case will try to do. It will try to track, track or find. Just give me one minute. Track PDF of. I'm sorry. No, I don't know. That thing is not coming. So I don't know. I have not figured out how to make it come. 
but I think it's getting recorded. So, do you know how to make it come? I don't know how to make that disappear. Yeah, recording is going on, but I can't figure out if audio is getting recorded or not. Maybe you should have make this. Can is it possible in Windows to make this disappear and show up only when it's needed? Yeah, I think you should do that. If you can do that, then maybe uh, maybe then that will be. Easy. Okay, so we'll try to track PDF of. Uh, <coughs> messages ok so that is what we will try to do so it is good to start with the regular graph and think of this uh, properly so on a regular graph what happens on a regular graph every neighborhood see first 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 question to ask is uh, this is the same question I asked last time also right so uh, it is it's, it's ok so it is possible for me to just hand wave through this but before that I want to just point out why all these things that we are hand waving through are slightly meaningful. Okay, in the previous case, <coughs> we had neighborhoods for the regular. Okay, so we'll start with the regular case. Okay. So, so I could I could just track one random variable for the uh, for the message, right? So because the reason is every neighborhood is identical in the regular case. Okay. And the message after L iterations is a function of that neighborhood. Okay, and all the neighborhoods are identical. And if they are all tree-like, okay, the random variable I get for the message or the message will pure will will be identically distributed across all bits. Okay, so it's enough if I define one random variable for the for the message that's flowing on an edge. Okay, so that's the first question you should ask, right? I mean, if you have a if you have a graph, you, maybe you should have asked this in Gallagher A itself, but maybe people didn't worry about it. If you have a graph, there are messages flowing on different edges and in real life for a practical uh, thing with finite n, the different messages will have, will probably have different probabilities, right? But we don't, we don't worry about it. We are saying we are going to let n tend to infinity since the message is, since the graph is sparse for a finite L, all my neighborhoods are exactly the same. So the PDF of the, the random variable or the message that is coming out on the top will be exactly the same. So, will will depend on the exact same things in the exact same way. So, if I denote a random variable for a message, I can have the same random variable for every edge. I do not have to keep using different random variables to track all of them. Okay. That another thing that helps, helps me there is the all zero assumption. Okay. If I cannot make the all zero assumption, all these things will, will be problematic. Okay. So, we will once again make the all zero assumption. Okay, again, this is justified by the symmetry of the channel. Whether it is plus 1 or minus 1, the channel does not care. It adds the same Gaussian random variable to it with the same mean and the same variance. Okay, so another assumption we will make is neighborhoods are tree like. Okay, <coughs> since, I'm, since I have a regular graph, I am saying neighborhoods are tree like all my neighborhoods will be exactly the same and all the random variables I mean all the messages will be according to the same distribution okay so i don't have to have different distribution for different messages if i go to irregular what will i do how, how do i take care of these neighborhoods being different average. you average over all possible neighborhoods and then you say i have a concentration result which says any one case is very close to the average so i don't have to worry about it okay so that's the way to do it in uh, the regular case, but for the regular case, you will make all these assumptions and proceed. Okay, so that's one thing. You are tracking the PDF of the message. So, so the thing will get more complicated. Okay, so we'll have to worry about <coughs> when you add random variables, when you add independent random variables, what happens to the PDF? It gets convolved, right? So when you do some complicated function like f, the function that we had on a random variable, what happens to the PDF? How will you find it? So our function f is a nice monotonic function, right? Log tan hyperbolic. So you can use one of those standard Jacobian formulas to convert from 
one PDF to another PDF. Okay, so all that, all those tools we already have. So one can possibly imagine tracking the PDF through your check node update and the bit node update. Okay, previously it was very easy, just simple discrete probability. Now you have continuous random variables, but the random variables are only being added and some nonlinear function is being applied to them. You know how to handle all those changes on random variables in terms of PDFs. Okay, so you know what to do to the PDF when all these things happen happen to random variables. So we should be able to track the random variables. That's one thing. The other thing is, what can I say about probability of error from the random variable and its PDF? Suppose I give you the PDF of a message. Okay, how will I compute probability of error? What is the probability that that message is in error? What's the meaning of saying the message is in error? When will the when is the message is when will the message be in error? Yeah, so I've already made the all zero assumption. So I know my code word was all zero. So when is a message in error? If it is negative, okay, so that's the thing. Any message is in error because messages are LLRs. Any message is in error if that message is negative. So once I have a PDF for the message, I can quickly find what's the probability that the message will be less than zero. What will you do for that? Integrate from minus infinity to zero a PDF, you will get the answer. Okay, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Message is an error if uh, it is negative. <coughs> okay, so what should the PDF be for the for the message if my probability of error needs to be zero? <laughs> so how, how will it look if I plot the PDF for a message? Yeah, so its its support will be purely positive, right? So it will not have anything on the left side. Okay, it will go off to something like. That. Okay, so so that's the thing that we will be tracking. So previously, what did we do for Galaga Ray? We, we had this PL and we wanted that PL to tend to zero as L tends to infinity. So what will we want for the PDF as L tends to infinity? We will want it to move to the right. Okay, so initially it will not, it will not be in the right, right? You know how to find the PDF for BPSK AWGN. It will have some part which is negative also, right? Slowly you will want, as you iterate, that PDF you will want it to move to the right. Okay, as it keeps moving to the right, eventually the probability of error will become zero. Okay, it will, well, we'll see, we'll see how it works out. Okay. So I want to stop here. I don't want to do <coughs> uh, pick up with that uh, later. We'll we'll start looking at this next week.